Hi. All right. Well, hopefully you like the new setup. Maybe get used to it. Yeah, Joey likes it. All right. Uh, service this Sunday in Estes. Hopefully you can make it. And, uh, and like I said before, we will try to add a fourth Sunday as uh, we're able to do so. And um, we do want to at least uh, try it on the fourth or fifth uh, Friday or Thursday, excuse me, where we uh, set up and have an actual more of a church service on a Thursday night, just once a month, you know, uh, give opportunity for folks that are unfortunately can't make it like their own times uh, with those circumstances. And um, that's all I have for announcements right now. Anybody need any prayer, prayer requests tonight? Everybody doing well? Always. Always. Yes. And we've been praying for you as a group. We've been for your mom and your dad. And, uh, Mark? Oh, you know. Oh, yeah. Is it going to be unspoken? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's for Landon. And, of course, if you're on Facebook and uh, connected to Camille, his daughter, you will know uh, Landon just being a boy. And unfortunately, he learned the hard way. But uh, <laughs> Grandpa's laughing. We're all laughing. Landon, if you ever see this video, we love you. <laughs> we love you. Praise God. We'll pray for him, and then we'll get some singing going on, and uh, keep on going. Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord, in your name, we ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would touch our class tonight, our service, and we're asking God that you would uh, help us and give us revelation, and Lord, help those that are sick, help darling's mom and dad, Lord, uh, that you would intervene and bring healing to them, and that you would touch Landon tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray, and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.
that people who are uh, against the Bible and against God want to show and put in our face. And I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this contradiction, but uh, we'll get to it right in the beginning. And then after we clear that up, we'll go on with, with more of Peter. So we'll start with Matthew 4, 18. This is Jesus calling Peter. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. So Peter was a fisherman, uh, and he's called by Jesus. He was called to follow him, called to be an apostle, called to be a disciple. Uh, a huge role that, that he was given. Now, there's a different story of Peter's being called in John chapter 1. And this got me because I was looking at both of them, and... I could not figure it out, and then I realized, okay, wait a minute. It's at two different places. It, it isn't the same thing, because I thought it was the same thing. So let me just, uh, in John chapter 1, Andrew and another apostle were listening to John the Baptist when Jesus was baptized. And I believe it was the next day, Simon and this other uh, disciple uh, went and got his brother Andrew went and got his brother Simon and said, you got to hear, this is the Messiah. And he brought him. And at that point, uh, Jesus said, follow me. But what we had just read is another place where they were fishing, and the two brothers were there, and Jesus called them and said, follow me. And that, wow, that could really sound like, uh oh, there's an error. These two guys are writing something wrong. But then I realized, when they were with John the Baptist, they weren't at the Sea of Galilee. They were at the River Jordan. Right. So it's a different time. So it's, so it's not a contradiction. It's not one saying one thing and another saying another thing. It took him about two different times. And as far as the call, different calls can be made to a person. As a matter of fact, there was a, there's a third call to be apostles to all 12 of them. So... Peter was called to be a disciple of Jesus. And he actually went back to work as a fisherman. And then Jesus was up in his neighborhood and saw them too, knew them. They knew Jesus too. And he said, come follow me. And at that point, they left their nets and they went immediately. Which I don't know how his wife handled, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so two different times kind of two different calls. Uh, just like we get different calls when we go to church. I mean, we get a call to the gospel to, to repent, but then we get a call to some kind of ministry, maybe a call to a deeper spiritual life. Different calls all the time. God can call us many times. So that kind of explains that. Uh, I actually had in my note that the actual story was this, but it wasn't the actual story. It's a different, different time. Uh, now, I want to give you some detective methods uh, to find out more about the Bible by having these methods. And I'll probably give you three tonight, but um, let's see. This one's a little bit of a detective thing. Uh, he was probably, Peter was probably born in Bethesda. Bethesda is a city on Galilee where the fishermen were. And he moved to where his wife lived, 
which was in Capernaum. Now you say, how do we, how do we know all of that? Well, it's conjecture, and that's why I, I don't have it as a scripture here. It's, it's, we're learning about Peter that uh, he had a house there, and there's places where Jesus came out of the synagogue and went to Peter's house. And when he got to his house, Peter had a wife. Well, let's read the scripture, Matthew 8, 14. And when Jesus was come unto Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Who would we say that? His mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And Jesus healed her. So that, that's to be settled. But we learn a lot about that. So he had a wife. I don't know if he had kids. It doesn't say. He had a house. He was in Capernaum. Even though he's a fisherman, probably out of Bethesda. Uh, now, that's how we can dig some facts out of, out of Scripture. Now, here's another fact we can get. And this is another detective thing you can do is what is omitted tells you something. So when they talk, when the Scripture talks about John and James the sons of Zebedee, a number of times. You never hear Simon and Andrew, the sons of somebody. And it would have been Jonah, because it was Simon bar Jonah, is another place. So we assume that uh, his father was probably dead, but he was with his, his wife and his wife's mother-in-law that we do know about. So we can't say for sure that's, that's it, but that's a way of when, you, when you're reading the scripture, when it's it doesn't say something that it normally does. It means something. I can take you back to back to Genesis 3.15 when God was giving the judgments and he talked about the woman and her child. But all through the Old Testament, it was the man and the son of the man and the son of the man. But he talked about the woman and her child. That was out of the ordinary, and it is out of the ordinary because that was a prophecy of Jesus. So that's the kind of thing that you can do is to say, why did he say it that way when they always say it this way? Another, another example is whenever something is doubled, it's very important. Verily, verily, I say unto you. That's usually really pay attention to this. So these are little, little things that we can do. Here's another one. Um, you can learn to be a detective by looking at rhetorical questions. When a rhetorical question is asked, it implies that the answer is this. And what they're trying to do is show that, of course, this is the answer. The example that uh, I've given you before is in the book of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. It says, some of you say you're of Apollos, some of you say you're of Saul, some of you are from Peter. And it says, were you baptized in the name of Saul? That's a rhetorical question implying, no, I was baptized in the name of Jesus. And he went on to correct them about this separation. But, but by asking that rhetorical question, he was really getting to the point of, obviously, you were baptized in the name of Jesus and not in the name of Saul, Paul, or Thomas, and so on. So that's, that's another uh, way you can look at it, is a rhetorical question to give you examples. Um, you think of Sherlock Holmes. If, if you can't figure it out, it must be something that's improbable. And there's things that are improbable in the Bible because of miracles. And we just have to have to accept sometimes. We don't always have, I know the people who say that they walked through the Red Sea because it was a low point and there was a drought that time and the water was really low and that's how they got through the Red Sea. That is easier to understand in the carnal mind, but the Bible says they spread the water and held it up on the sides and they walked on dry land. So uh, sometimes the thing that's not the most likely in our minds is what actually happened. And if God's word said it, it's true. So let's talk about uh, Peter a little bit more here. Uh, Peter walked on water. I pulled this one out just because there's only one person that walked on water other than Jesus, and it was Peter. Uh, Matthew 14, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, thou, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And Peter was come out, down out of the ship, and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And we know the rest of the story. The thing about the story is, is that Peter was a bold guy. Peter was, actually you can see him being bold when he went to a crippled person and said, such as I have, give I thee, rise and walk. And he lifted him up and had the faith that he would not fall back to the ground. 
Peter was a very bold character. Uh, Peter also was, uh, well, I guess a, a normal human, normal human male, sinful man. Uh, Peter lied. He lied with an oath, which they weren't supposed to take. He cursed. He went around naked. He was violent, and he was unlearned. Just some of the things that you can probably remember each of the scriptures for that. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came to him and saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I do know not, I know not what thou sayest. So he, he lied there. Going down a little further, and when he was gone out onto the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him, them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And finally, after a while, came unto him, they said, that stood by him, and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech, sorry, ran out of my bereath me. Has anybody ever used that word before? Bereath? <laughs> Betrayeth, but bereath thee. Then began he to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. So he lied, he lied with an oath, and then he cursed and lied, and so on. A man, a human man, you'd say, okay, everybody has their, their failures. Um, John 18. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Okay? Again, he was bold. He was impetuous. He was a physical person who took things into his own hands. That was Peter, uh, a, a ruddy fisherman, if you would. Now, I found something interesting. The other Gospels, when they write this passage, you know where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said, one that stood by cut off his ear. And only John mentioned that it was Peter. Now, I, again, using a little detective thing, were they still trying to protect him from being arrested for being the one? Maybe that night they didn't know who it was that cut off his ear. Jesus healed him, that took care of the situation. But if they knew who it was, maybe they would arrest him. Uh, so maybe the other gospel writers protected him by saying one that stood by. But that's an interesting thing. When you see that, you say, why, why did they say that if they knew who it was? So maybe, maybe it was because he was protecting Peter. John 21, 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, you know who that is, John, saith unto Peter, uh, just as it, I, I noticed that John was extremely humble. Wherever he, he tried not to use his name and was always uh, trying to not be the center of attention. But he said to Peter, the Lord came to where they were fishing. And I'll tell you, this is between when he resurrected and when, he, when the day of Pentecost happened. So nobody had the Holy Ghost, but Jesus had resurrected. They went back, Peter went back to fishing. So he's at the, at the water and John is up there saying, it's the Lord. Okay. He said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto them, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. So here he is, he's out working naked, and and John comes up and says, Hey, it's the Lord. <laughs> now does that remind you of somebody? It's got to, somebody raise your hand if it reminds you of somebody in the Bible. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Somebody who was naked in the Bible. Adam. Adam was naked and he ran and got, got hid himself. And then, yeah, and then got the fig leaves and so on. So uh, Peter was a man just like Adam. But this is before he got the Holy Ghost, before the church. Uh, now, just to mention again that nakedness is like your sin shown in the physical. You're naked. In the physical, it's like your sins are broadcast. If everybody knew our sins, we'd be very embarrassed. Same thing as if we didn't have clothes on. Uh, nakedness was usually a negative, almost always a negative. Uh, the de demonic man that was in the, in the graveyards, he was naked. And after Jesus cast the devils out of him, he got his clothes on. Um, Noah was naked when his brother saw him. One of the brothers laughed and the other two were respectful and there was a curse because of that. So nakedness is always a type of bad and sin and so on. 
And Peter knew that, and he put a coat over himself and then threw himself into the, into the water. Um, Acts 4.13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been, been with Jesus. And that we've just heard this recently, but being with Jesus gives you that, that uh, above and beyond what you, what you can learn. Uh, Brother Lopez, do you have two doctorates in the Bible or one? Zero. Zero, okay. Yeah, neither do I. But that doesn't matter. Be with Jesus and we can do this. Uh, also, I wanted to, to say this. What you were before doesn't determine what you'll be in your new life. Okay? Because Peter was just a ruddy fisherman who swore and cursed and lied and was naked and, and cut off people's ears. He was just, just like us. Or something like that. But that didn't determine what he would be in his new life. So it really is a new life. It is not turning over a new leaf. It is a new life. And we can't let the past determine anything about what will be in the church. Um, we may keep some of the characteristics of what we were, but that doesn't, uh, the old life doesn't hinder the new life, praise the Lord. Now, uh, you might have been shy in your old life and you're still shy, or God may change you to not be shy. You may be uh, aggressive and you're still aggressive, but you're in the Lord and you're, you, you know, you're aggressively going after Bible studies or talking to people. Some of your characteristics will stay with you. The sin doesn't stay with you, nor does anything that, oh, you were a, you were a this or you were a that. That doesn't stay with you into the, in the future. So you don't have to change to be into some cookie cutter, cookie cutter Christian, some model. You can be yourself, but anything in the past is, is gone. It's washed away, and then we can do what we, we, what we can be the most, what God can make the most of us. Now, Peter was, I, I'm going to jump back and forth between some bad things he did and some good things he did. So, Peter was in the inner three disciples. So, Jesus had 12, but he had three that were even closer. I'll give you three examples. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. So, he went in a little bit further. He didn't make it past an hour of praying, but he was taken by Jesus like, you're my real close ones. Now, the rest of the disciples could have got mad and said, I quit. I wanted to be in the inner circle. Right? So let us remember that, that, that just because we're not, you know, on the platform or, you know, pastor's best friend, it doesn't, it doesn't change our position. Uh, it, whatever it will be, will be. Uh, when Jesus raised the ruler of the synagogue's daughter, I don't know what her name was, damsel. Uh, and he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Those are that, those three again. They went in when Jesus raised that girl from the dead. And then one more example, at the Mount of Transfiguration, and after six days, Jesus taken with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart from themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And we won't go into what that all is, but three, three real inner working people. Um, now, here's again, now we're back to uh, Peter being a little carnal. Peter rebuked Jesus, and he was rebuked, rebuked by Jesus uh, when Jesus was speaking about his suffering and his death. So Jesus was getting later into his ministry. He was telling them, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to suffer and die. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Taking Jesus and, and say, you're not going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to let you. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Poor Peter. I mean, he's doing something good, and he got rebuked. And, but it's a good teaching. It's a good teaching. Um, one more example that I found, John 13 
Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou shalt no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> He's impetuous. And he, he changes on a dime. He was again telling the Lord, you're not going to do this. And Jesus corrected him, and then he said, okay. So, it's an interesting guy. A really interesting guy. He had, sure had the heart for the truth, and he had the heart for where he went after what he wanted, once he understood. Uh, we do this not talking to God usually, I hope we don't, in prayer, say, God, you won't do this, and God, I don't like that, and God, you got to change it. But we do it with questions. We say things to God, why are you doing this to me? Or aren't you going to do something about this? We kind of give it to God with questions. It's like a little bit of a rebuke, like you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what's going on. Why are you being bad? It's kind of like what Adam, Adam and Eve said. You gave me that woman. That's why I was bad. <laughs> that didn't mean the woman. The woman could say you gave me the snake. <laughs> but we put it off. And so, again, we can learn. We may not rebuke the Lord face to face or, you know, in prayer. But we can rebuke him when we ask questions or, or get mad at his, his will and his way. Um, we can also rebuke him by just plain disobedience. Not doing what we know we're supposed to do is rebuking the Lord. So we can relate to Peter because we have flesh. Now, Peter, here's a good thing. Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. I'll just stop there. Simon Barjona. Simon, his earthly carnal name, let's say, Bar meaning from Jonah. So his father was Jonah, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So in front of the other apostles, of the disciples, he was given the keys. They knew he had the keys, and, and he, he certainly used them on the day of Pentecost. Now, um, he was renamed Peter. Can anybody uh, raise your hand if you can? Think of somebody whose name was renamed in the Bible. Saul. Saul, Saul was renamed to Paul, right? Jacob was renamed to Israel. Abram was renamed Abraham. Uh, and Simon was renamed to Peter. Uh, Peter was sometimes referred to as Cephas. And you might say, okay, where's that name come from? I thought he was Peter. Well, Cephas is the same meaning, a stone, a piece of a rock, or a rock, a small rock, uh, only in Aramaic. And so when Jesus was talking and said, I can call you Cephas, uh, he was using Aramaic. But when it was written in Greek, they used Peter almost all the time. Uh, I saw Cephas maybe six, six, eight times in the, in the uh, New Testament being used. And I'll tell you why it was used some other places. But when Jesus said, thou art Cephas, they were, he, was, he was using the Aramaic, the language that, that was culturally correct for them. Uh, John, 4, John 1, 42, and he brought him unto Jesus, Simon, uh, Andrew brought Simon unto Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. I'm not going to get too much into the stone rock and Catholic Church and all of that. Uh, maybe for another day, if, if, if ever necessary. But Peter was not the beginning of the church, the rock the church was built, built on. He was probably a stone in the foundation of the church, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. But he was not the rock on which the church was founded. The fact that Jesus was the Christ and that he died for our sins and rose again is the rock that the church is founded on. Now, Peter had the keys. So, of course, on the day of Pentecost, when all his energy could be channeled into the right direction, uh, 
But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be known unto you, and hearken unto my words. He then preached and ended with, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which they had just received. So he's telling the people who hadn't received. So Peter is the central part here. He had been given the keys by Jesus, and he was the one that got up. Now he was unlearned. I mean, certainly the physician would have been maybe a better speaker in our eyes. But Peter was given the keys, and it was, had nothing to do with how bad of a guy he was or how good of a guy he was in his prior life. God chose him, changed him, and now he's, he's uh, the chiefest of the apostles at the time. He's giving out the keys. He's saying, how are you locked into heaven and what it's going to be if you're locked into earth? He's the, what's uh, loosed on earth. Now, the rest of the apostles were there. And they all concurred with what he said. They didn't correct him and have a different thing to say. Peter had the keys, and what he said bound things in heaven. So uh, I read some commentaries, and it's just so sad to see them talk about this and not get it. Their eyes are covered, yet they read the word. Uh, but Peter, Peter had the keys, and there he fulfilled uh, John. Chapter 3, born of the water, born of the Spirit. Now, Peter did mighty miracles through the Holy Ghost, and he coined the line that we're going to read here, that Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the guy rose up, walked, leaped, went through the... was a huge miracle that many people got to see and question. And then they brought them in, and you know the, the story of... Uh, and coming before the, the elders, the chief priests, and so on. Um, just another example, Acts chapter 5, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. He must have been the lightning rod, even of all the, the apostles, because it doesn't say anybody else. It was with Peter's shadow. Uh, he, he, he had... God was working through him so much. And that probably is the way it is, is that the one who's having the influence, God can work through, or God will work through and the person will have the influence. If God wants to work through somebody and they want to get rich, I don't know how far that's going to go, and, and so on. So uh, you think about, think about that, that the Peter's influence and, and what God did through Peter. Acts chapter 9, Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, make thee whole. Arise and make thy bed, and he arose immediately. Didn't even know that story. Kind of read over that in, in the past, but uh, another healing. Acts chapter 9, a couple of verses later. Now there was born at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed and laid her in an upper chamber, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Jesus rose through the Holy Ghost, had risen from the dead, had these miracles. Now at the very end of, I believe it is John, it says, of, of the, the, the things that Jesus did would have the volume, volumes and volumes of what he did. And you're going to do more. Not any one of us is going to do more, but the body of Christ is going to do more. And so there's, there's people rising from the dead here in the book of Acts, a couple of different places, the, the kid who fell from the rafters and Paul, but other places. So yes, there is more resurrections. There are more miracles. There are more eyes than when Jesus did in his single body in the single location under a few years. Many more things can be done. Not necessarily one of us is going to have 12 people raised from the dead. That probably doesn't mean that. All right, so uh, Peter, now Acts 1.8, I didn't put it up here, but he said you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and you will be 
you will be uh, witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what he said to them. Now, we know on the day of Pentecost, they received the Holy Ghost, he preached. That was in Jerusalem. Now, Peter was sent to Samaria when they received the gospel. Acts 8.14, I'll read that. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Not going into the, in the, uh, the salvation here, just that Peter was sent kind of to open the door to the Samaritans. Now remember, we heard Jerusalem, Judea, the Samaritans, and the uttermost parts, which would be the Gentiles. So he's already been there for the day of, day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Now he's been sent to Samaria for the Samaritans. In Acts chapter 10, he was sent to the Gentiles. And when Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as, as well as we? Okay, so now Jerusalem's been covered. Um, Samaria has been covered. The gospel has been the, the preaching of water baptism and, and infilling of the Holy Ghost has been preached to the Gentiles and received to the Gentiles. As... Uh, the apostle in Jerusalem, he stayed in that area until the very end of his life. And he was not the bishop of Jerusalem. We already covered that. James was a bishop of, of Jerusalem. So he was a, an elder, an apostle, the person they could go to for maybe for doctrine, to settle things. He was there when they had the doctrinal conference. I don't know how many years after, but it's, it's recorded in the book of Acts. But he went around the dis diaspora. Diaspora is when they spread the Jews out all over the world. He went to the cities around Israel, and he ministered to all the Jews in that area. He went to the diaspora. So that's Judea. And that finishes Acts 1.8, which says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentiles. So Peter actually brought it to all of those, just like he said, you'll go into all the world and do that. Now... We're into the book of Acts and, uh, with Peter, and Paul comes on the scene. And after his conversion and being taught by the Lord, uh, he, he then went to Jerusalem and he conferred with Peter. And that's an interesting thing. You know, he, he got it his own way, and then they went and conferred. And it doesn't say they had any disagreements at all. And I covered that a few weeks ago, or months ago, how Peter and, and Paul both taught and did the exact same things. We, we, we Put them side by side. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Galatians 1.18. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Uh, doctrine was the same. I already showed that earlier. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, the uncircumcision. And Peter was the apostle to the Jews, the circumcision. Galatians 2.7.8. There's a number of places where they, they grasp this. Okay, you're, the, you're going to the Jews and I'm going to the Gentiles. It's kind of like came upon them. And I got something that I, I want to quote. You, you can quote me on, on what I'm going to say. But let's read this here, Galatians. So, contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, Gentiles, was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James Cephas, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So they, 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 they clicked, they understood, I see what's happening. You're having blessings in working with the Gentiles. You're having blessings working with... They talked about um, that they seemed to be pillars. They perceived the grace. They saw the, the works that were done. They were wrought effectively. Here's the statement. Doctrine is fixed, but ministry is discovered. Okay? They weren't taught, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. They discovered that by the Lord working with them and what opened and what closed. 
But doctrine was fixed. That doctrine's settled. They didn't discuss doctrine. That, but they did discuss and, and they discovered their ministries and they went that way. And that should be us. We should discover our ministries, but our doctrine is, is, is fixed. That We don't go discussing, what do you think about another way of being saved? We don't have those discussions. We may discuss who's going to teach, who's going to preach, who's going to do these things. So doctrine is fixed, but ministry is discovered. Jesus alluded to Peter's death, coming to the close um, to, for tonight, John 21, 7 to, 17 to 19. Uh, and he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said it unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, Lord, thou, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou would not go, wouldest not go. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, follow me. It was another, another follow me. So he, he, there's more than, more than one follow me. Um, now this part I don't, I've got it read, not gospel, um, from readings. And, and again, I won't vouch for it. He died in Rome. He was crucified upside down. It was around 64 AD. When was he in Rome if he was the apostle to the circumcision and stayed in, in uh, Judea most of the time? Well, he wasn't there very long. And here's the detective work. If you look at the end of the book of Romans that Paul wrote, he gives honor to many, many people. And he doesn't even mention Peter. If Peter was there in Rome, he would have given honor to Peter in his salutations at the end of the uh, at the end of the, the book of Romans. So by saying that, we kind of know that Peter or Peter was not in Rome at that time. Yet he was in Rome when he was he was killed, and so he was only in Rome probably a short time. But again, this is extra biblical. It's probably historical. I don't know those people. I don't read those as much. Uh, what they found out, but that's that's what you can get from saying, well, why didn't they include his name? Well, maybe he wasn't there. And, you know, so you, from what isn't there, you can learn things. So uh, we're going to go on to the book of Peter, Lord willing. I've got uh, to be continued at the end of this. We're going to talk about the authorship, the audience, when it was penned, where it was penned from, the main themes of the book of 1 Peter. Uh, we'll get into all that. Now, 1 Peter may not be a book that you go to very often, but I have a, a little mnemonic way of finding these books faster. Maybe not the minor prophets, but certainly the books of the New Testament. I look at Hebrews as a dividing between Paul and some of the others. So if you can find, if you know it's a Paul letter, it's before Hebrews. And if it's a John, Jude, um, what I got? Uh, James, Peter, they're after Hebrews. And of course, it finishes up with Revelation. So, you know, if you're like, Titus, okay, that isn't Peter, that was Paul writing to Titus, so that's before Hebrews. And, and there you are, a couple pages and you got it. If you're looking for Peter, after Hebrews. And so Hebrews becomes a nice nice break in your New Testament to help you find it fast. I don't know what that's worth. Um, one last point. Um, I don't know why I'm throwing this in, but one last point. Peter was awesome. I mean, huge. He would have had big letters at the beginning of the, the movie or whatever. He's, he's a big player in the Bible. Abraham, Peter. But Peter was soon followed by Paul. How many books did Peter write? Two. How many did Paul write? Fourteen. Who reached the rest of the world? Paul. And Peter, and Peter was Judea. So as great as he was, there came along somebody who you might say had an even bigger influence on Christianity going forward. And what I want to say about that is, be your best. Don't think you're the best. I think about this, and Bobby Fischer was a chess player who I, I looked up to when I was a kid. I got into chess doing that. And then he was the greatest, absolutely the greatest. 
until Gary Kasparov came around. And Gary Kasparov held the champions, you know, the, the world title for years and years and could beat anybody. And, you know, the big debate is would he have beaten Fisher if Fisher could beat him? Well, probably not because time had moved on, 20 years more theory and so on. Well, Gary Kasparov has now been eclipsed by Carl, Magnus Carlsen, who is higher rated than anyone ever has been higher rated. And not, not only that, he just stopped being world champion because he's been it and that's, he's beat everybody. So we want to learn that, you know, I want to be the best of something. Well, I want to be my best. I don't want to be the best because if we're trying to be the best, even Peter was maybe ousted by Paul and, and so on. So that's just a, just a thought about uh, while we're talking about how great Peter was. So, uh, Lord willing, next time we will get into the book of First Peter and answer those questions and then go through the scriptures and, and what is the theme and really what he's trying to say. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, one thing that came to my mind is, <clears throat> in the tail end, as Brother Van Alice mentioned, about be your best, don't try to be better than, than others, is... Uh, and it's Mark Morgan. Uh, he's a fantastic pastor of a small, powerful work in San Francisco, uh, but he's also an evangelist. And he talked about the grace of God and how where, and I'm probably going to butcher it a little bit, but um, that if God asks a certain person, he used a, a church analogy, church planting, and if someone takes five steps, that would represent, uh, just as an illustration, and that five steps represents 500 people, uh, that church plant. Uh, but he may ask another individual and in another group to take two steps, and that may represent 200 people. Who is greater or who is out of the will of God? Neither, because, you know, the grace of God allows us to, basically what he was saying is, you're doing what God told you to do. And so be your best in what God tells you to do. If you have 200 that God wants you to give in the kingdom or 500 again he's using this analogy church planting then that's what you do so I, I agree with Brother Van Allen be the best for what God has told you to be don't try to be better than someone else because in fact it was Brother Hundley not Huntley but Brother Hundley uh, who was with us probably about a year ago the missions conference and he's he's a mighty man of God in uh, Saudi Arabia Air Middle East now he's in St. Louis headquarters and he's global missions, and he talked about how we do an injustice that, the, in his mind, the true heroes equaled as global missions are those that start churches. And how we celebrate and go, wow, they had so much revival over here, but we never celebrate. Not never, but in so many words, we kind of just put it on the back burner uh, for church planting. And so be be uh, very conscious and know that we're in the will of God you're in the will of God you're, I said it last week you're strategically planted where God wants you to be and regardless if it's 100, 200, 2,000 souls we'll reach everybody that we can in Miranda alone it's 52,000 ish but you still have Avra Valley you have uh, Picture Rocks you have uh, Red Rock you have all this surrounding areas Northwest Tucson and so there's a lot of work to be done but with that in mind, the goal is in the kingdom of God, helping each other become what God wants us to be. And we've talked about that left hand, right hand, and being where you want to be. And so uh, take that, uh, encourage yourself. Uh, posted something today, I think it was today, or was it yesterday? I forget, man, yeah, I'm forgetting. I need a little bit more caffeine. It was today, uh, or yesterday, about uh, the mustard seed. And the mustard seed is small, but uh, God uses that small beginnings and that if God gives you a promise in your life, whether it's lost children coming back home to the Lord, uh, financial breakthrough could be a healing, uh, that you respect the process that God starts it small, that, that grain of mustard seed, but that small grain of mustard seed does not dictate what God has for you in the future. That promise, that, that blessing that is much bigger. And so you just chip away. And so chip away in your prayer life. Um, missionaries have said that in America we give up right away. We don't, after praying maybe a couple days, a couple weeks, for example. But that what we don't do is we don't chip away. We don't chip away in prayer. 
and just keep on going through failures, through discouragements, and so forth. And so, uh, I'm not sure exactly why I'm saying that, just letting you know what just came up my mind. Um, but I think we should pray right now. I know it's Bible study, and it's, we keep it purposely more calmer that way because we need to teach Word of God. Uh, but perhaps you uh, will or have got into a place where you think, you know what, I'm not good enough possibly, or man, I wish I could be better like that other person. Because like Brother Van Allen mentioned, there's always going to be a, a Paul that's going to do 14 books if you do two books. Well, who's out of the will of God? Neither. They're both doing the best that God has called them to do. And so you do that. It's not because God doesn't think you're capable to uh, help with two books uh, or 14 books in this, this instance. It's just we don't know the mind of God. He just calls us where we need to be. Amen? And so let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Uh, we're so thankful, God, that we can not just hear the preached word, but understand your word. We're praying, God, that you give us even more revelation tonight, that, God, that you would encourage and strengthen each believer here tonight. God, as you help us to become what you want us to become in your kingdom, God, we're here tonight to edify the body of Christ and, and to strengthen and help folks to become what you want them to be, Lord. Whatever it is, God, I pray that it not just be self-discovery, but you'd help us to help the saints be perfected in your kingdom and help them to become the best thing that you want them to be in the name of the Lord Jesus. Guide their footsteps, encourage everyone. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Praise God, thank you much. You are dismissed. There's still a little bit of food there. Praise God.